spent any amount of time in Africa, you have probably uh, had some encounter with uh, poverty, uh, with people who are underprivileged, people who are poor. Um, and, uh, you know, whether you are African or have lived here from outside, that's probably something you have experienced. And just thinking about my own family, uh, for example, uh, thinking of my father who was uh, born in a family of eight kids, uh, five girls and three boys. Uh, they were from the Usambara Mountains, are from the Usambara Mountains um, in uh, the Tanga region, uh, a poor family. Uh, I remember vaguely hearing stories of my uh, of my dad starting school at the age of about 10 um, and how he uh, went to school uh, without any shoes um, and he had an older sister, the firstborn in their family, Shangazi Maria, and she uh, studied all the way to being a teacher, which, you know, back then uh, was a really big deal, still a big deal today, and we have many teachers in here. Uh, we love teachers. We think teachers are amazing. Uh, but certainly back then, it was, it was a big deal, um, and she is the one who put him through school. Uh, and my dad, from his family, was the only one who actually went as far as university. And, and just thinking about us now as a, as a family and an extended family, I've, I've seen there's been, you know, there's been progress, there's been economic progress, uh, but there's still, there's still poverty, there's still challenge in our family. Um, and, and maybe you have similar stories, stories where you hear of the kind of obstacles, the kind of superhuman effort that seems to have happened to overcome difficulties. You're like, wow. Uh, what am I complaining about in my life? This kind of puts things in perspective. We are currently in a, a series on the topic of honor. This is the fifth week that we are looking at this topic of honor. And uh, I just want to thank the, the guys who have been working to make sure the sermons are getting up onto our website. So if you have missed... Um, that you can go there, you can download, you can listen to what God has been saying to us on this uh, topic. Now, as we, as we look at the Bible, there is um, a particular group of people that God zeroes in on. You know, we've been talking about honoring God, um, how do we honor each other, um, but there's this particular group in the Bible that God says the way we relate to this group speaks about whether we honor him or whether we dishonor him. And, and this group of people is the poor, people who are less privileged. And uh, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about how we honor God or dishonor God in terms of our relationship with people who are needy, people who are less privileged than ourselves. So if you have a Bible and you are encouraged to uh, come every week with a Bible, we put up the verses on the screen in case you didn't bring it and also being mindful of the fact that sometimes we'll have people here who uh, maybe don't have a Bible because they're still exploring the claims of Jesus Christ. So we want to make it easy for them to still engage. But really it would be great if we all came uh, with our own Bibles so we can follow along and then go back and make reference to uh, what we have looked at later. I want to take us to the book of Proverbs and to chapter 14. Uh, verse 31, Proverbs 14, verse 31, and this is what it says, it says, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. 
Proverbs is a collection of wise sayings. And there's many fantastic words of instruction that give us wisdom on how to live with each other and also how to live with God. Uh, This particular proverb is believed to have been written by King Solomon, who at the time was an extremely wealthy man. And, And even in his wealth, King Solomon was mindful of the poor. He had a revelation from God. He had insight, wisdom from God, which led him to see that the way he treated poor people, the way he related with poor people was a big deal. It had an impact on his relationship with God. Anyone who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. If we abuse poor people, if we take advantage of them, we are disrespecting their maker. To show contempt, is, it's like to insult. And who is their maker? Well, their maker is God. We are dishonoring God when we oppress the poor. Now, what, what are some of the ways that we can oppress poor people? We can oppress poor people by not treating them with dignity. We can oppress poor people by denying them their rights. We can oppress the poor by verbally, emotionally, physically abusing them. We can oppress them if if we have someone who is who is poor, who is needy, working for us. We can oppress them by not paying them a fair wage. There's different ways that we can oppress poor people. And, you know, it doesn't matter if this uh, poor person is a Christian or if this poor person is a Muslim or a Hindu or an atheist or whatever else the case might be. It says here that if we oppress poor people, we are dishonoring their maker. All people, irrespective of their religious background, their cultural background, are made by the Creator God. By God. All of them, all of us, have the same maker. All of us have the image of God in us. All of us show something of God. We reflect God, irrespective of those things. And when we oppress a poor person, we are dishonoring their maker. Now, the Bible is clear that the image of God in all of us has been corrupted by sin. And that this... Is that an amen? That the image of God has been corrupted by sin. And, and, and that sin is an offense to God. There is a broken relationship. And that this sin requires judgment. It requires punishment. Because God is just. But because God is also gracious and merciful, God has made a way to restore us to Himself. He has made a way for us to be forgiven of our sins. He has made a way for us to be reconciled to Himself. And there is only one way, Jesus Christ, His Son. There is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved except the name Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We know that. So if we have put our faith in Christ, we have a relationship with God. We have been saved. We have been rescued. 
And if you haven't yet put your faith in Jesus, if you haven't yet believed in Jesus and said, Jesus, you are my Savior. I believe in you for my sins. You must do that. That's the only way God has made for you to be reconciled to Himself. Now, whether poor people have believed in Jesus or they haven't, and the Bible says the gospel is good news to the poor, so we would hope that many would believe, but even if they haven't, made in the image of God to oppress them is to dishonor God. When people are poor, and I'm speaking from personal experience and what I've observed, when people are poor, we tend to put less value on them and more value on those who are of better economic means. We, we tend to kind of marginalize the poor, just put them somewhere there and, and seek the favor of those who are rich, those who have more. That's where we want to hang out. And I'm guilty of this as well. I mean, I don't know if you have ever done that. I remember when we were uh, in the process of, of relocating uh, back to Tanzania and we, we were in Zimbabwe uh, visiting uh, Trudy's family and her uncle, uh, he's a big tough guy and uh, he says to me, Sheshi, this church you're going you're gonna to go start, treat everyone the same. Treat everyone the same. If you do that, your church might have a future. If you don't, there's going to be a problem. And I'm like, man, you know, those were few words, but they were truth. Poor person, rich person, whatever the case, treat everyone the same. Treat them all as image bearers of God. Treat them all as people that have dignity. Now we tend to disregard the poor, put them aside, but God, on the other hand, He has a special place in His heart for poor people. You see, the rich can use their riches to get some measure of security. Poor people, on the other hand, are vulnerable. Proverbs 10.15 says, The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. But poverty is the ruin of the poor. For those of you who have jobs in this room, if, if we were all to lose our jobs today, that would be terrible. It would be a massive issue. It would change our lives drastically, but it would be more terrible for the poor. Because the rich have a fortified city. They have wealth. They have some kind of protection. They have a wall. Something that can give them security. The poor, their poverty is their ruin. They're vulnerable. They're in this difficult place. And God says, I see them. My eye is on them. I care for them. I want to place them on your hearts that you would honor them. Do not despise them. Because you will be dishonoring me if you do. Of course, we mustn't take the security that money gives too far. Because then it's, well, it's, if, 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 if I can have security in money, then all I must do is I must just get lots and lots and lots and lots of money. Well, the Bible also says that wealth is fleeting. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So we, we actually can't go that route. First thing is to honor God. In fact, God says that the rich should be instructed to do good with their wealth, not to put their hope in it. To be kind to the poor is more than saying, Pole sana. Ah, Pole. Wait, wait. There's nothing wrong with saying Pole. I think it's, 
this you know we were just hearing about language and the the, the way that language is just has like special meaning in it that word pole there's just something so beautiful about it that it just captures and there's that's a good thing that we can say pole i'm sorry that you find yourself in this situation it's tough i i i sympathize with you To, to, to be kind to the poor is more than praying for the poor. We pray for them. Yes, we must pray for them. But it's more than that. To be kind to the poor is actually to be moved to action. It's actually to do something about their situation. It's to do something practical to address the situation that they find themselves in. On Tuesday morning, I was in my office at home. Uh, working to prepare for this morning, uh, getting my, my sermon ready. Uh, Tuesdays, I, I try to be really focused on sermon preparation. Uh, that's kind of my day, because other days of the week, uh, busy with other things. And there I am, I'm, I'm cracking on, and I get this text message on my phone. And it's from a friend. And this friend is describing how he has just been robbed. And um, I know the the economic situation of this friend of mine. It's not a good situation. And the little that he, he has has been stolen from him. And you know, you, start, you could start having thoughts. Man, why, why wasn't he more careful? Why, why did he let that happen? Why doesn't he ask somebody else? Why does he think Sheshi's the guy who can solve his issue? And you can start having, oh man, and I've got that situation. I've got my own stuff going. And I'm like, man, you, you've just read, <laughs> you've just read Proverbs saying that if you care for a guy in a situation like this, you're honoring God. What is God looking for? God is looking for obedience. God is not looking for a rationalization of my situation. God is saying, this is what my word says. You obey it, you do it. And obedience is at its best when it is immediate and with a good attitude. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to pause the preparation of the message. And I'm going to do what I can to help. And I'm not saying this, guys, to, to, to kind of like boast. I'm just saying this is, I think, a helpful illustration that happened in my life during the course of this week. Do I always do that? And sometimes I, I get messages and I'm like, mm. I had another friend of mine this week, uh, a Muslim guy. And uh, he, he often looks for me when he's in kind of difficult situations. And honestly, there was a season where I just wasn't entertaining his requests. His calls would come, <clears throat> messages, and this week there was just like fresh conviction, like, you know what, actually, that's just so dishonoring of God. That is, despising this guy is insulting his maker. So I did what I could, and I said, okay, here you go, brother, I'm, I'm just going to help you out as much as I can. I think God was testing me this week. I think, it's, I think it's Rick Warren who said life is a test. Man, this week was a test. And so far, I think I'm doing okay. Lord, please, no more. Just on this one for a bit. But our hearts do get hard. And we get self-absorbed. And we dishonor God by not seeing the poor that are around us. This concern for the poor, it actually carries over into the New Testament. This is, this is not an Old Testament thing. Like, well, you've read from the Old Testament. We're now in the New Testament. Actually, the, the Old Testament points us to the New. We, we can't actually separate the two. They go together. But the New Testament carries on this message of caring for the poor, of honoring God by caring for the poor. And, and we, we can actually see this in the life of, of the Apostle Paul, that in the new covenant that's been established by the blood of Jesus Christ, caring for the poor remains a priority on the heart of God. 
He hasn't put it on the side. He hasn't said, well, now carry on with some other things. That's no longer my agenda. As we look at Paul and and how he relates to different churches, we see this theme of caring for the needy. It's, It's right there. He wrote to the churches in Galatia. He wrote to them primarily to defend the gospel from legalism. False teachers were teaching that to be justified, uh, that is to be in, in right relationship with God, the gospel wasn't enough. You needed the gospel plus the law, the law of Moses. Just believing in Jesus? No, that's, that's not enough. You need something else. So we'll take the gospel, great, but add to that the law of Moses. And Jesus says, and, 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 and Paul says, Nonsense. That is not the gospel. Justification, being in right relationship with with God, is through Jesus Christ, is through faith in Jesus Christ. And as he's proclaiming this, this message of the gospel, as he's defending the gospel from legalism, Paul gives the Galatians a window into his past. He says, listen, guys, somewhere in my past, this is what happened This is something that went on in my ministry. And in Galatians chapter 2, he recalls that he and Barnabas were accepted by the apostles in Jerusalem when they recognized the work that God was doing through them in preaching the gospel among the Gentiles. And they gave him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. That's recognition of God's grace in Paul's life. And you know what they did? They said, Paul, we only ask you to do one thing. We only ask you to do one thing. As you preach the gospel among the Gentiles, which we are. And they asked that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to to do all along. Paul and Barnabas had already demonstrated a commitment to helping the poor. In Acts chapter 11, we read that the church in Antioch, Paul and, uh, he was Saul at that time, Saul and Barnabas were there encouraging the church, and we read that that church in Antioch decided to provide help from famine. There was a prophetic word. Prophetic word comes, there's going to be famine in Judea, and the disciples in Antioch, which the Bible tells us is the first place that followers of Jesus were called Christians, they decide to take up a collection for the believers in Judea, where the famine is coming, where Jerusalem was. And they give their gift into the hands of Saul and Barnabas. And they say, you guys take the gift to Jerusalem for us. So when, when these guys are saying, hey, we, 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 we want you to, to continue. They, they're saying, we, we've seen that this is something that you are concerned about. You have a track record in this. This is something that is on your heart. Carry on doing it. Keep caring for the poor. Keep remembering them. Keep being there for them. And Paul says, listen, this is the very thing that I had been eager to do all along. It's not like it's, a, it's, you know, it's something heavy. It's not like, man, this is a burden. He is eager. As Paul reflected on the gospel, as he thought of what the gospel meant in his life and in the lives of other believers, he, he's like, man, caring for the poor must be right at the center of that. I am eager to do that. Faithfulness to the gospel in Paul's life was not only seen in preaching the gospel. Yes, we must preach the gospel. We must teach each other the gospel. We must grow into the gospel. We must get stronger in the gospel. But the gospel is also this dimension, this aspect of meeting the physical needs of the poor. That's also part of it. 
as a church, over the years, we have, we have been committed to helping people in need. We've done different things, and I, I'm not going to mention them all now. But certainly from r- the very beginning, when we were still a house church, man, this has been something that God laid on our hearts and said, look, go for this. Do this. Care for those in need. Provide for them. And by God's grace, we've been, we've been doing that. We had a, a finance team meeting last week. Um, and Godfrey, head, head of our finance team over there, and we were just talking about our, you know, our expenditure as, as, as a church. And you know, there was this concern about how are we being faithful in how we care for the poor. Because about 10% of our income goes to caring for people in need. And it's, it's actually beginning to go beyond that. Actually, we want to be good stewards of caring for people in need. And we don't want to stop. We want to keep growing in this grace. It's not like we've arrived, friends. I think in order for us to honor God, we can do even more by His grace. As we respond to the gospel, we can do even more. So I want to end by sharing some practical steps that we can take to show kindness to the poor. I just realized that this might be an uncomfortable topic because some of us might be sitting here thinking, yeah, I'm that person who, who is in need. I'm that person that needs. And, and some of us might be thinking, I'm that person who has. And I, I man, I, I feel kind of bad for not having done more. Well, I think for both groups, God's grace is here. That the atmosphere should not be one of condemnation or signaling, you know, kind of pointing out. It's, man, the grace of God. God's love, God's kindness, God's goodness is available to us all. We're a family. A couple of thoughts in terms of how we can respond practically. Well, firstly, I'd say we should work hard to earn as much as we can so that we can share with the poor. If we work, let's work as unto the Lord. Let's give our best. Earn all that we can so that we have something left over to give for those who are in need. Listen to what Paul, again going back to him, says to the elders of another uh, church, the, the, the church in Ephesus. This is what he says to them. Acts 20 verse 34 to 35. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must, not we could, we might, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And Paul here is not talking about his hard work in actually standing and preaching the gospel or sitting in a group and preaching the gospel. He's talking about hard work with his own hands. And from elsewhere in the Bible, we know that Paul made tents to support himself. And he's saying, guys, you elders, you church leaders in Ephesus, this is the example I gave to you. I worked hard with my own hands to provide for myself and for those who are weaker than I am. So let's work hard. Let's have a culture of hard work, of giving it our all, so that we can glorify God by giving to those who I need. Secondly, let's live a modest life, being content with what we have. If we can live a modest life, being content with what we have, we will have something extra to give to a poor person. But if we are, if this is our income level here. And our lifestyle is pegged here or here. Because that's possible. Your income can be here, but your lifestyle is here. Or it's here and it's right there. 
If we live a modest life, which is, man, my income's there, but I'm going to peg my lifestyle somewhere here, content, trusting God, grateful, believing Him. Man, there's some margin here to give to someone else, to give to the poor. Thirdly, give generously to the church. As we give to to, to the church, I was struck by that line in that song, uh, your holy church, we believe in this, believe in this, believe in this. And one of the things is your holy church. And I was like, wow, man, the church again is a big deal. And, And when we give, you know, to the work of God through the church, which is the body of Christ, it's kind of like his hands and feet We are giving to enable us collectively to do the work of being a blessing, of honoring God by caring for the poor. Fourthly, make your giving to the poor an item in your budget. If you do a budget, personally, I I honestly need to get better at doing budgets. And maybe you do too. But if you do a budget, you can have a budget line which is actually allocated to say, hey, you know what, let's plan for this. And, and my next point is related to that. That we should be prepared. Prepare for it. What does prepare for it kind of look like? Well, it kind of looks like when you get to the traffic lights at Mwenge and that guy jumps on your windscreen and starts washing it. And I think for the first time I had the front and the back washed the other day. I don't know if that's... Has that always been happening? It's like an innovation. And it's like, man, that's that's good. Because that guy is trying to be faithful with what little he has. He's saying, I don't want to steal. I don't want to go and... And, 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 and rob somebody or do something. I'm going to take the little that I have and I'm going to do this very basic work. That guy created in the image of God. So being prepared looks like, well, when a guy like that comes, you've actually got something there that you can pull out and say, hey, thank you so much. Because preparation helps us to avoid frustration. Maybe it's having a little food parcel that you carry around. I don't know, it's just... Just thinking about the situations where you're in and you're just being prepared. And it doesn't have to be much. But the thought that goes into saying, I want to honor God. And the last one, this is not on the the slides because it kind of came this morning as I was doing last minute prep. Just thought, man, as a church, I think we need to get a champion. Just felt the Holy Spirit say, the church needs someone who, who can bring these different things together. The things we're already doing and the things we want to do. Have somebody who says, you know what, I, 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 I know we all love this, but I feel a particular calling. I feel a particular gifting. I feel a particular burden. And I have some kind of experience where I think I could contribute in this area to just help us as a church move forward. And I think that's something we can pray for as a church. So brothers and sisters, as I end now, my encouragement to us is let us honor the Lord by remembering the poor. Let us honor the Lord by saying these these precious people are a priority in our lives. And as we do that, as we grow in this, we are honoring God even more. And thank you so much for all that we are already doing, all that is possible through the generous giving, through the, you know, the the efforts. I know this this stuff, stuff that happened during Love Da, for example. Thank you so much. But can we take it even further? Can we grow even more in caring for those who are in need around us? Shall we stand? Guys from the band, is it, is it okay for you guys to jump up now and um, just help with some tingly music? It's keyboard, guitar, some, some of that good, good music.
because I want to pray and I always feel helped to pray when uh, one of you guys uh, is there uh, to just give that support. And uh, what, what, what I would love us to pray for now is to pray firstly for people in this room here who perhaps feel I am actually that, that person who is poor. And you know, being poor, it's a relative thing. Maybe you were at that level of income and you know, things are now there, things have changed. Or it's just kind of an absolute poor thing where, man, I'm just poor. I just feel I'm, it's, that's me. And, I, and I'm just feeling a lack of hope, a lack of faith. And I just need God to touch me. I need God. I, I need God to just, just to reassure me that I really am created in His image. And He cares for me. He has a plan for me. I know that's a sensitive thing. I just felt, man, it would be good to pray for you this morning. So if that's you, I, I just want to invite you to come, to come here. I'd love to pray for you. If you feel that, yeah, I, I feel that's me. That's my situation. You know, if you can imagine, as these letters are being written to the different churches, you can't do this unless you know who it is in your community that is in this situation. There's this kind of a transparency and a vulnerability. If God is saying, care for the poor to Paul, well, you've, you've got to, like, well, who are those people, you know? And I know this is kind of a unique thing to say, well, yeah, am I going to be that person who says, I'm struggling? I'm asking if you have the courage this morning. We just love to pray for you. I know people have been going through job losses. Companies are closing. I'm speaking to Uber drivers. The number of Uber drivers who are Uber drivers because they have lost their jobs. And I love Uber. But I can only imagine that in this room there's, there's real challenges. Just feeling God. God, what has happened? What's going on in this area of my life? I just feel God wants to touch you. I just want to pray for you. If you want to, if you're a leader, and you just feel you'd like to come and lay hands and support these guys as they come to the front, that would be great. Father, thank you for these dear ones, these ladies and these men. God, that have been created in your image. Lord, thank you that you love them. And Lord, forgive us where we have just not given them the dignity, even among our own community. God, I pray today that they would be encouraged to know that they are your daughters and your sons created in your image valued valued by you God God I pray that hope would rise in each of them I pray that your peace would come I pray that your joy would flood them I pray God that you would give them faith to trust you again. I pray that they would be content and yet hopeful. They would be content but yet trusting you and believing that you are able to meet their needs. And God, even now, we pray that you would meet every need. You would meet every need according to your riches and glory, according to your purposes, Lord, the breakthroughs that are being needed here the breakthroughs that are needed here, God, would you break in and make a way and provide, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, you are good. You are a good Father. You are Jehovah Jireh. You meet our needs, God. 
And Lord, I pray that as a church, as a church, we can respond. We can respond in a, in a way that is honoring of you. Honoring of you, God. That we would first respond here at home before we can even think of what is out there. Thank you for these brothers and sisters. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we applaud these guys for their courage to come up? Bless you guys. You guys are amazing. We're going to have communion now. Take up the Lord's Supper. You guys can go back. Love you guys. We have our four stations for the Lord's Supper this morning. We are going to remember what our Lord Jesus did when he gave his life, when he died, his body given, his blood shed for us. So shall we head, I think, through, through the middle and round the sides, maybe that's quicker, back to our seats, and then we'll take it together. Let's do that. Karibuni sana. Karibuni kwenye meza ya baba, meza ya bwana. Thank you, Lord. Let's take the, the bread together, reminding us of the body of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave your body. You didn't hold it back. Let's take the juice reminds us of his blood shed for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Makes it possible for our sins to be forgiven, to be in right relationship with God. And Lord, as we go into this week, 
may we remember that the gospel your body given your blood shed you not holding anything back compels us to go and do the same and share our lives and hold nothing back amen